Welcome to Research Craft, a series about how historians at all levels go about doing history and what we can learn from each other. I'm Robert Carl. This two-part episode is framed around the field of public history. However, as you'll hear, my guests take an expansive definition of what constitutes public history. The result is a wide-ranging conversation about audiences, different kinds of writing and engagement, and what it means to do history for the world around us. In part one, I speak with Catalina Muñoz, Associate Professor of History at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogotá. Catalina's publications include the 2022 book, A Fervent Crusade of the National Soul, Cultural Politics in Colombia, 1930-1946. Catalina has been involved in a number of public history projects in Colombia and the United States, which we talk about in this episode. She has also previously served on the steering committee of the International Federation for Public History and is a member of the editorial board of the journal International Public History through 2024. I also speak with Martha Sandweiss, a professor of history now emerita at Princeton University. Marty is founder and director of the Princeton and Slavery Public History Project. A past president of the Western History Association, she is also author of numerous books on topics including photography and the U.S. West. Her most recent book is Passing Strange, a Gilded Age tale of love and deception across the color line. All of the books and public history projects referenced in this episode are listed in a bibliography in the description below. Catalina, Marnie, thank you so much uh, for coming on ResearchCraft. Uh, it's really a thrill to be talking to two people um, who have drawn a lot of inf inspiration from and have been big supports uh, in my career. So welcome. Um, as we get started talking about public history, I think it would be really great to just lay out some definitions. Um, and I want to start with a quote. The practices we have come to name public history are characterized by their diversity. Furthermore, they have changed over time and have had different national or regional trajectories and connotations. And Catalina, those are your words, uh, actually, from a piece that you published in the journal Public Historian, uh, I think last year or the year before. So maybe you could build, uh, Catalina, on that statement of yours and, and what you understand public history to mean. Yes, I think, thank, thank you so much, Robbie. I'm so happy to be here. I, I just want to begin saying that. It's so nice to be able to have this conversation. Um, yes, so what you just read, uh, I'm going to add to it. Because yes, it's, first of all, I think it's a very difficult field to define because it's so diverse. And it means different things in different places. For example, in Colombia, the term public history has taken hold as historia pública, but it doesn't translate well at all. You know, it's a form of practice. Here, public, we, we, the word public, we associate it in Spanish with, with um, the state, with public resources. And that's not the way public history goes. So it is very diverse, which makes it difficult to define. But I would say that the, a definition that I like is what, uh, for me, public history is when history is put to work not for the sake of uh, academic work, but when it is put to work for and with audiences that are not academic. Great, yeah, that's a really important distinction, the, the for and the with the, the public. Um, Marnie, what would you add to that? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here, Rob, and so nice to meet you, Catalina. I'm so glad you brought up the international differences in how we talk about public history. I had a little experience working with public historians in China, and it became so clear to me at that moment that public history is a practice that's defined in relationship to particular publics. And the publics in different countries and in different uh, political systems work in different ways. In a nutshell, in public history, history is for the public. It's an absolutely not history done by the public. Whereas in the United States, it tends to have that valence that uh, public history is something that has multiple stakeholders who put it together. That said, I, I think there are different definitions of public history even within the United States. One might be the public history that gets taught in graduate programs now, which steers people towards a very uh, particular set of practices governed by uh, certain kinds of historical theory. And the other, is my definition, which is broader, really just along the lines that you've outlined, Catalina. Uh, history practiced outside of the classroom. Events outside of the classroom uh, for a much broader audience, in some cases executed by a much broader audience, sometimes executed by professional historians, and sometimes um, put together by people who are not professional historians. Great. Well. In a, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll get into some of the public history projects that you've 
both been involved in. Um, Marnie, you've primarily worked in the United States. Catalina, you're involved with a number of, of projects um, in Colombia. And I, I mean, one, one question I'll have for you later is how much uh, work you did in public history uh, as a graduate student in the United States. Um, but one thing I don't know, even though we've all I've known both of you uh, for quite a long time is how you got into this field um, of public history. And I think that's gonna be, uh, you're gonna each have your own story, which again, speaks to this diversity and what the field is. But one thing that, that really strikes me, um, you've both written on the history of photography. Um, so I'd, I'd be very interested to hear about how that also sort of either led into or sort of goes off of your uh, interest in public history. So Marnie, why don't, why don't you take this? I mean, when, I guess, how long have you been doing public history and, and how did that happen? Your story is unique in a lot of ways, I think. It's definitely unique. I was a public historian before I was a historian. A after college, at the end of college, I decided I wanted to apply to graduate school in history, but I wasn't at all sure about becoming a professor. So I applied for and received a fellowship and I worked for a year at the National Portrait Gallery, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution. And I found I loved working in museums. I loved the mix of challenges. Something could pop up on your desk that morning and you had to solve it by lunchtime, or you might be working on an exhibition that would take you many months or perhaps many years. I loved the challenge of communicating to a very, very broad public. And I love the challenge of working with visual images because I think uh, people who don't think of themselves as interested in history can relate to a picture. I then went to graduate school, but in the middle of my third year in graduate school where I was studying to be a colonial American historian, <laughs> and probably I got offered a job as a curator of photographs at a museum of Western American art in Fort Worth, Texas. And I spent 10 fantastic years there. I wrote so many books, I traveled around the country, I got to help build a collection, and I learned so much that helped me in my subsequent um, career as a, as a classroom historian and as a professor. From there, I was an art museum director at Amherst College, and at Amherst College, I eventually transitioned from being a museum director to being a classroom professor, and uh, I now teach at Princeton. Great. And Catalina, how about you? Um, I don't know, for instance, how your interest in the history of photography or photography as a, as a particular form of historical source uh, originated. Yeah, well, my, my interest in public history started the second I finished my BA, as soon as I finished college. I wrote these, uh, the thesis we need to write for graduation. I love doing the work, but as soon as I finished, I had like this crisis of who's going to read this? No one's going to read this. No, it took so much work and just going to sit on a shelf. So that got me into a little bit of a crisis in terms of, of thinking what, how did I think of myself looking forward? So I decided to not go to grad school yet. And I spent a year teaching high school and another year uh, working as assistant to one of the curators at the National Museum. So I had a chance to work during that year at the museum uh, on the curation of an, a new exhibit about the, the conquest of America. And that opened my eyes, you know, allowed me to see how history could be put to work in different ways than I, ha than I had been taught in college. I love the chance of thinking about how to communicate these complex ideas to water, wider audiences, to school children. So I love that. And I decided to, my, my first um, step into grad school was getting a certificate in museum studies, which I got at Harvard. So I, I was, I loved that, that year at the museum. So I went there and during my year getting the certificate, I also worked, a, I did an internship at the Peabody Museum, working with photographs of different expeditions by Harvard anthropologists all over the world. So that was my first experience working with photographs and such a different work than the historians. You know, I had to label things, spend hours in the cold room looking at things and just asking different, relating in a different way to historical sources. Um, and well, after that, I decided to go to grad school and get my, my PhD in history, which I did, and that was great. I didn't want to give up the working with the public part. So I did, um, I was research assistant to Professor Nancy Farris for a year. She was working on this big exhibit of Latin American uh, uh, objects, colonial art. Uh, in, so we visited the collections of the museums in Philly, um, I kept informing my, my experience in grad school from, from that, that perspective. Um, then I came to Colombia, started teaching at a university, 
and very quickly got involved with some colleagues. My first experience teaching here was uh, I worked very closely with anthropologists. And I had a, um, uh, one of my colleagues was starting a project in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, uh, and he wanted my help with archival work. And I said, happy to do that, but you take me to the field. Let me pause you for a sec. This is up on uh, Colombia's Caribbean coast. Yes, in Northern Colombia. Um, so it was my opportunity because I wanted to, to put history to work with communities, with people who cared about what I was doing. So I started this project and I ended up working again with photographs from a Swedish anthropologist who had been in the Sierra in the early 20th century. And we did this beautiful memory project with the community who had a difficult path, history with a um, community of Capuchin missionaries who were there and the photographs were a great starting point for the oral histories we, we did. So it's been sort of changing as I go. And then more recently, I've been working on how to put history to work for peace building in Colombia. But I think we'll have more time to discuss that later. So it's been, yeah, a, a, a road that started a long time ago. Okay, oh, I, I hadn't known that that deeper history, personal history of yours. That's really fascinating. Um, well, maybe though we can get into some of the public history projects um, you've been involved with. Um, so Catalina, why don't you pick up where you left off and tell us some of the, in some ways, very contemporary, like recent history projects that you've been um, involved with. Okay, so the public history project I'm working on now is called Historias para lo que viene. And it's a project that started uh, five years ago in the context of the signing of the peace agreements uh, of the Colombian government with the FARC guerrillas. At that time, me and a group of other colleagues from Universidad de los Andes and Universidad Nacional, as well as a fantastic group of students, undergraduate students, we came together with a preoccupation. And is that we thought that the decisions that Colombians were making in the plebiscite for or against the peace agreements, in public debate, that was a, the, the, the public discourse was very ahistorical. People were making a decision to vote for or against the peace agreements based on very presentist arguments. You know, on the one hand, they thought that um, the war in Colombia would end with just more war. You know, if we kill all the bad people, there will, will, will be peace, which ignored, you know, where does the war come from? And on the other hand, a lot of optimism about signing a piece of paper and then there will be peace. It's like, no, 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 peace here means such a commitment from all of us and such a deeper understanding of what the causes of conflict are. So our concern uh, back in 2016, 17 was, Public debate around peace is very ahistorical, and that is in a large part our fault as historians, because we're locked here with all these things we know, but we do not care to communicate, to, con to have a conversation, to open a debate. So we started this project uh, with the objective of designing strategies to enrich the public debate around peace in Colombia from a historical perspective. And we've done different things. Um, the project that I'm focusing on now is a project in which we're producing stories with communities who have been affected by the armed conflict one way or the other. Uh, these are collaborations in which we really co-produce together. Now, it's not the historian that comes to tell someone else's story, but we produce together. We, on, in one of the projects, I'm working with school children and with, with their teachers in different parts of Colombia, and in the other one, with uh, community leaders, Black community leaders in the Chocó. And the idea is to tell stories that are not, you know, they complain that there's a lot of memory work in Colombia, but they say that this memory work um, leaves them in the condition of victims. They are only victims when this work is done. Or they also complain that journalists come, take the stories away, they take the stories, but they remain in the same place and without um, gaining from the experience. So what we're trying to do is to create storytelling with them in which they can tell their stories the way they want to tell them. You know, their stories of victimhood, but also longer histories that include resilience, you know, how they organized to deal with armed conflict. And very importantly, we're, we're also delving into the longer histories that have led to these forms of violence. So how can we produce stories that are that don't go back 10 years, but that maybe go back 100 years? You know, how do we explain that Black communities, that Indigenous communities, that, that women, are so disproportionately affected by the conflict. So this is not reduced to, an, to the armed conflict. No, this comes from, um, this need, needs deeper explanations. So that's the project I'm working on now. And that involves working with um, people who are storytellers because we historians are not. 
Uh, so I had to learn about how to tell a better story or work with people who know how to do that, with journalists, with artists, um, photographers. Also working collaboratively with communities, you know, breaking. When I started doing poly history, my perspective, I think, was very vertical. You know, I have knowledge which I'm going to go make available to others through a museum, for example. Um, I think now I'm much more aware that we need more um, engaged scholarship in which we as academics can come knowing that we have something to bring to the table, but also open to learning from others who are also bringing something to the table. Uh, and that implies different methods, just changing. You know, I find that my training, my grad school training, of course, is great in some, for some things, and it's very lacking in others. I mean, that has been my experience. I started teaching public and applied history last year, and it really fundamentally changed the way that I thought about both teaching and then also sort of the practice of history. And we'll, we'll talk more about that um, in a minute. Um, but Catalina, let me ask one follow-up question. What, what form have this, has this storytelling taken? Um, my understanding is you're producing uh, radio. You're doing a lot of this storytelling via the radio, for instance. That's what we're, the two projects that are ongoing at these moments, are focusing on that, on podcasting. For now, what I've done, which, which I'll, I'll share the link to later, is I, 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 a couple of years ago, I partnered with a storytelling program based at Rutgers University in Newark called Newest Americans. And what they do is they produce storytelling about the immigrant experience in the Newark area. Uh, and I was impressed by their work, you know, how they tell stories with the community and so on. So we partnered and we did a project here in Bogota, in Suwa. Um, we partnered with a local radio station, Suwa Laire, and we worked with a group of victimized people in the context of the Colombian armed conflict to experiment with different forms of story storytelling. And we produced different things with them. We produced some radio stories that came out through that community radio station in which they told their story in a format that was telling it to a child in their lives, which made them tell a longer story that wasn't focused on the victimization. So we tried that. That, that came out. We produced a family album for each one of the participants in which the, we printed the story that they shared orally for that child. And also some photos that they wanted to share with us about their history. And we produced also maps with them of their displacement in Colombian territory as another tool to tell story in, to tell their stories um, in the territory, right? As they moved. So I'll, I'll share that, that link later. We experimented with that. Now I'm focusing on the storytelling for podcasts and, and community radios, basically because it's the media, radio is the media that which is everywhere in Colombia. So you can reach very far away places where other media will not get, but also through a podcast form, we can reach urban audiences, you know, young people who are really our targets. All right, so Marnie, diversity, again, tell us something about the public history projects that you've been involved in. I'm sure they're more numerous than, than even I realize. Well, you know, I, I spent the early part of my career doing museum exhibitions, and I, I absolutely count that as a form of public history. But I want to say something about the interconnections between my academic history and public history tracks right from the Great. start. The most important thing I ever learned in graduate school came out of one casual conversation with a professor who had won the Pulitzer Prize that morning. And we said, sir, who do you write for? Who, who's your audience when you write? And he looked us, at us and he said, intelligent Martians. I had no idea what he was talking about. So I raised my hand and he said, excuse me, sir. So we did call our professors, sir, in those days and they were all sirs. I said, sir, intelligent Martians. And he said, yes, I always imagine that my reader is very smart but I never imagined they know anything about my topic. And that has been my guide to writing, whether it's writing a three paragraph museum label or an exhibition book or a scholarly book or an article ever since. I guess I write for intelligent Martians. Um, when you work in a museum as I did, you have to become very good at a particular kind of storytelling as Catalina was mentioning. You have to be able to convey some basics literally in a hundred words in a label you have to be able to convey complicated ideas in a slightly longer wall label. And then you have an exhibition book, perhaps, where you can expand it at greater length. So I did quite a few museum exhibitions. The project I've been working on most recently in terms of public history is something I call the Princeton and Slavery Project. 
and it's an exploration of Princeton University's historical ties with slavery. I am not a historian of slavery, but I understood this was an important project to do and nobody else was stepping forward to do it. So it's a project that was done in collaboration with many, many people. And one thing we haven't talked about too much yet is yet, although Catalina brought it up, is the idea that collaboration is key to so many public history projects. Uh, you might be collaborating with other historians or with students and colleagues, but you might also be collaborating with fundraisers, with web designers, uh, in the case of museums, with architects, um, exhibit fabricators, and so on. So you need to be willing to work outside of the silo that so many history students are taught to work inside of. You need to be open to sharing and learning from other people. The Princeton and Slavery Project um, has been expressed as a website. We don't want to do a book. We are still growing, even though the website first launched in late 2017. And it continues to get between six and 7,000 hits a month, which seems really remarkable for something that's been up for so long. But we have um, 108 different stories that are posted on the website, and they're, they're cross-referenced with one another. So that if you're reading a story about one person, you can find the other stories in which he or she appears. We've digitized, as you can see, 426 different primary sources. So this becomes a source that school teachers can use, for example. Um, and we've also incorporated um, maps, graphs, video stories, etc. One thing that was very clear to me from the beginning here, and Catalina alluded to this a little bit, is that different people learn in different ways. I'm a reader. I like to read. I don't really even like to watch television or watch movies that much. But other people take in information in different ways. So as a part of this project, um, I don't think we'll go there now, we uh, commissioned a series of plays with a, with a local theater. We provided uh, archival evidence to six or seven young playwrights, each of whom wrote very short plays. And as I said to them, I'm a historian. I have rules. I have to have footnotes. I cannot speculate what's in someone's head. But you are artists, and you can you can invent whatever you want. So please take these stories. I would love to be allowed to imagine what these people feel. And the playwrights went and ran with it. We also commissioned a visual artist to um, to, to do a site specific uh, installation on the Princeton University campus. We did projects with the public schools, with the public library because our public was everywhere. It wasn't just Princeton students or administrators or faculties. It was our town. And as we've since learned after hundreds of thousands of web hits, it's the world. Um, so this has been a really gratifying project. The contributors range from high school students to very, very senior scholars. Um, and we continue to grow. Uh, our, our, we're growing now with more stories about race uh, generally in the 20th century. We've, we've hit the easy topics for the 19th century. So there's always, always more to do. And I don't think a book would be a productive way to, to distribute this material. I mean, one of the other ways, if I'm not mistaken, that the project um, has sort of come into the world is in the built environment as well. If you walk around Princeton's campus, there are plaques uh, showing where African-Americans lived in, in the 19th century. Could you say something about that? Well, the, the university <laughs> has had a cautious response to our, our study, I would say. But yes, they've renamed um, an arch on a campus building in honor of a runaway slave who once worked on the campus. And they've uh, named a little parklet built on top of the library uh, in honor of an enslaved woman who was once the property of one of our university presidents who went on to become a very distinguished uh, missionary and then an educator. Catalina, did you want to say I something? I wanted to say something that I was thinking, just looking at what Mar in Marnie was showing us a second ago, that I think is also central to public history. Marnie, you started by saying that you're not a, you're not a historian of slavery. I find that often when we're trained uh, in grad school, we are trained to become specialists in something and we cannot talk about anything unless we know everything about it, which makes it difficult to be a public historian because you're constantly hesitating. But I think that public, historian, public history does invite us to be a lot more flexible and to see how we can trust the tools that we have to do things for the world, in the world, that do not entail us to be the super expert and be able to write a book on the topic. 
it is very scary, but it is also very fulfilling, I think. You know, I find it very fulfilling. Um, it's, you know, you have the chance to, I, the way I think about it is that, you know, I have a set of tools that are useful to create knowledge, which I still do, you know, publish articles, publish books. You know, I have a set of tools that allow me to create new knowledge. But I think that's those skills that I have can and should be put to work in the world in other instances, you know, and that it would be a pity if we, if we don't do it, we're failing the world around us, right? So, uh, for example, you know, the work that I've been doing here, for example, what I'm trying to do is, you know, in, this, in the world of transitional justice, in the world of human rights, it's a world in which, you know, as, as I've been doing this work, the more I read, I find that, again, historians do not participate. Historians do not participate in these immense projects. And the result that we have is that often these are processes that are very short-sighted in ter terms of time, you know, that assume that human rights violations or that the way that communities experience um, the aftermaths of conflict and conflict itself is you know, bound to these years of dictatorship or, or civil war. You know, so very short histories. And we are overlooking how not only in people's experiences, but also in how, in, in our thinking as a society, how to solve these issues, we need to think long-term. And again, that's something I, I learned in grad school, how to think long-term, long you know, how to pose questions that go beyond the recent past. So I think poly history is, is you know, an, an invitation to put those tools to work for other things different than academic scholarship. Well, let me ask just a question, and then actually, Marnie, I'll ask. I'll, I'll let you answer first. And um, is it helpful to differentiate between public history on the one hand and applied history on the other? I mean, Catalina, this is something you you talk about a little bit at the start of that article uh, in the Public Historian that I referenced. I mean, Marnie, what do you think about this? Well, that's akin to what I wanted to talk about. I think there are some simpler, kind of lower stake ways that professional historians can be public historians without um, committing to a, a, the kind of multi-year project that you're committing to Catalina or that I was engaged in the slavery project. That is, uh, academic historians, our colleagues should be able to write op-eds. They should be able to go on television and explain complex events uh, to a broad audience of people. They should be able to help classroom teachers rethink how, how to teach something in their classrooms. So I don't, want listeners to your podcast, Rob, to go away thinking that public history means you need to leave your core work and go do something else for many, many years. Every historian can be a public historian. Yes. Catalina says we have the tools. We can read, we can analyze complex materials, and we should be able to write for those intelligent Martians. We should be able to write for everyone. And with those three tools, we can step into the public arena however we want. Now, these kind of toe dipping uh, exercises of public history probably wouldn't meet the standards of applied history in the way that um, you and Catalina might be talking about it, but I think they're very valuable. That's great, that's great. Catalina, what do you, what do you think? What are your feelings on this? Very much in the same line. I think that public, like public history is wider and there are many ways to do it. Um, no, when you rob, you you do it right when you write these uh, for judges right on the immigration cases, which doesn't mean that you stop being uh, interested in your in your research. Um, so we can do this in many ways, and I think applied history is one way to do that, but it's not the only way. Yeah, well, and this, this is something I was cautious of as I was thinking about and preparing for this conversation is to not differentiate between. Your public history, both your public history work on the one hand, and then you know your traditional um, historical work, you know traditional historical research scare quotes uh, on the other hand. Um, I mean, one thing I was thinking recently is, well, what if I uh, took the format and the approach I'm doing for these expert uh, witness reports that I do for Colombian asylum seekers in the U.S. What if I actually followed the same format for some of the historical figures that I was writing about? How would I sort of change from my, my normal academic uh, sort of writing mode, even the narrative mode, and really break things down in a very, um, a very, very basic way? I mean, I've, I've commented before that some of these expert reports I do are, are just really long Twitter threads. 
I mean, they're very, they're short declarative uh, sentences. They're footnoted, but, you know, they follow and, and the paragraphs are numbered and it's a very different form of presenting an argument than, than I've traditionally practiced. Um, so I've, I've been thinking about that the last few days. How could I maybe bring this format that I've spent, frankly, a lot more time this year working with uh, than I have doing traditional academic writing? Um, and how could that sort of maybe invigorate the academic work that I've been for whatever reasons a little more reluctant to do or you know I've hit a wall in terms of writing and, and having trouble getting into it um so you know Marnie let, let's not differentiate that much between the two but in what ways has being a public historian you know sort of in very practical terms like informed the way that you you do history and I, I given your trajectory it's not the best question to present, but that's how no, I'll present it's, it. It's, it's one I'm wrestling with right now as I work on a new book project, and I want a wide public to read my book. Um, in preparation, while I'm reading my book, I just read, I am devouring fiction. I want to see how storytellers work. I want to see how storytellers introduce an idea in chapter one, and then you're interested and curious and curious, and you have to wait till chapter six yeah. to find out who did it or why they did it or and, what. And you've taught at Princeton for a number of years a class on writing history. Uh, and you've of writing, yeah. Yeah, uh, and even though I haven't taken the class, you have had a bigger influence on the way that I tell stories than I think any other uh, historian uh, alive, so. Um, I'm honored and I'm happy to take credit for anything you've done, Rob. Yeah, well, but, but I mean, what, but what's great is, is to hear that, you know, this is still a process for you even though you've been thinking and talking and teaching more about some of these issues than, than you know, any historian that I know. Well, I mean, here's the challenge in my case. I'm writing an entire book about a single photograph. It was made in 1868. And really the photograph captures a split second of time. So the photograph doesn't have an implicit narrative. The previous book I wrote was about two people. They meet, they marry, they die, they go to court there was a narrative arc that was all ready for me to explore. In this case, it's a split second of time. So how do I make a narrative out of something that is inherently, um, well, non-narrative, if not even anti-narrative? So it is something I continue to think about and struggle with, but I struggle so much with one problem. As I suggested when I just spoke about those playwrights, novelists and playwrights can make stuff up. And we are historians, whether we're writing for intelligent Martians or our students or our colleagues, we are governed by the rules of footnotes. We, it, it's like we're going down the bowling alley lane and we can't, we can't grow out of those alleys. They're, they're filled up with those footnote rules. So I struggle all the time about how I can make writing engaging yeah. while still being true to the rules of my craft. It's hard, it's hard every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, Catalina, how about you? I mean, how has your public history work informed sort of the, you know, the more mo uh, monographic aimed writing, for instance? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's very different from Martin, just because I'm beginning. So I'm about to uh, put out my first book. So I have to say, I'm not yet at the point where I feel I can I, I'd love to do it one day, you know, to loosen up a little bit more with my academic writing. But at the point that I'm in, I, 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 I do feel that I need to play by the rules, you know, play by the rules in, in a big way. Uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, being able to, to break, break out a little bit. I think the way in which my public history work has influenced my academic writing, for example, with this book I'm putting out, which is my, my dissertation that is way overdue. You know, I finished grad school over 10 years ago, but then I got so involved in these oral history and public history projects that I just let it sit there. And now I finally had to go back and, you know, get it up now. It's, it's up, you know, it's going to be out in a couple of months. But I think after doing, yes, yay. But after doing these past few years of public history, I found myself more able to, when I wrote the dissertation, I didn't dare say anything about any period that was not the period I was studying. Now I was you know, rewriting it. And for example, what happened in Colombia at the end of last year, you know, all these um, mobilization, you know, in which I could find so many parallels in you know, issues with citizenship that are going on today, how the ruling elites see people who mobilize as, you know, they are not the good citizens. You know, they are not doing this the proper way. They are unfit. They are, you know, 
terrorists, this and that. And it, I think I've become more, I, I want to make sure that my work, my historical work has something to say to the present. I want to make sure that our reader today finds this. I don't want it to be just for the historians who are interested in the 1930s and 40s. I think 10 years ago, I wouldn't have uh, dared say anything, make a connection between the present and the period I study, because I then I thought my work was for people who were interested in that period. But now I want a, a contemporary reader in Colombia to find my work useful to understand what's happening today. Great, Marnie. I think you have touched on something so important, Catalina. That is, there are a group of people, like everyone on this call right now, who believes in the principle of public history, who believes in addressing issues for a broad audience, who believes in stepping outside of their comfort zones to help people understand the past. But the Academy has not caught up. And the Academy is still demanding, at least in the United States, I don't know about Columbia, that you play by the rules for your first book. The Academy has not really figured out, despite excellent efforts on the part of the uh, various public history associations, professional organizations, most history departments don't know how to evaluate public history work. Sometimes it's done collaboratively, sometimes it's not published by a university press. Really, we are historians, we should figure out how to evaluate that work. We shouldn't say just because a university press published it, it's academic. We shouldn't say just because it was reviewed in this journal, it's academic. Everyone needs to be expanding their horizons. Not everyone needs to practice public history, but we need to accept that there are standards for it. There's a way to evaluate it and we can learn how to do it. So I'm sorry that your first book can't be exactly what you want, but your second book is going to, and I'm gonna so look forward to reading it. Well, Thank you so much. It is the same here. It is the same here. I actually just had, I've been spending the past six months uh, precisely trying to move our administration to devise a way to evaluate this work. Because what we're seeing here is that I think this is similar in the US universities are now, you know, in, in their discourse to the outside, they're saying they want to engage, they want to be out there in the world, they want to have impact. But then when you look at the rules for promotion, they do not match at all that discourse. The, the way to get promoted is academic publications, which have those rules. So I've, I've been finding that well, universities are very old institutions and they are very difficult to change, but yeah. Well, one other piece of the craft we might include here is, is the teaching component of it and how that can inform both the way that we're doing the research and the way, you know, the, and the way that we're doing public history differently than we might if we weren't teaching it um, at the same time. So Marnie, one thing that you did for the seminars that you did on for the Princeton that fed into the Princeton and Slavery Project, um, you had archival hackathons where you invited students to come in for pizza, right? Or this is something one of the postdocs for the program, uh, the project did come in pizza and transcribe uh, what student records from, for African-American students in the 19th century. And that's always stuck out in my head uh, as a potential model. Th the challenge has been, you faced this last fall when you taught a class on, on archives. Uh, the, the challenge has been during the pandemic and for someone like me who teaches now at a virtual institution, how do we also reproduce that model virtually? That's, that's a great question. And I just wanna clear up two things for the record. One, the pizza did not come into the archives room itself. It was in the AP room. And uh, two, we were, we were working not on records of African-American students in the 19th century because Princeton had none, but on early, the, the origins of early Princeton students. Yeah, I, I work at Princeton. It's a wealthy institution. And during the pandemic, I was able to get our special collections to digitize the archival materials that I wanted to work on with the class. And to my surprise, it actually worked very well. I'm a big believer in touching the real thing. There were so many things I couldn't teach students about because they couldn't feel the photograph, how heavy it was or this or that, but they did have the front and the back digitized. And the, the university digitized lots of manuscript material for us. And I have to say that it proved easier for the students to, to transcribe when it was online, they could work at night, they could blow it up big on their screen, they could, look at different documents simultaneously, that almost proved easier than, for them than working on it in person. Um, I think for, you know, most of my colleagues work at institutions where they don't have those resources, but there is so much digitized online now. 
I, I think there are creative ways to replicate that experience for students who can't go into archives by basically borrowing the digital online archives that other people have put up and then just reharnessing them for your own purposes. And this is a point um, I've made in a, a different episode of this series, um, one that I actually recorded earlier, but will come out after this one, is I really feel that the sharing of these digital archival materials is a practice that um, a lot of historians were doing on Twitter early in the pandemic uh, that I think was a real show of collegiality and collaboration. And it's really one of the, the practices from the pandemic that I hope will you know, last uh, for the rest of time. And Kathleen, how about you? What's, oh, Marnie, go ahead. I was just going to say, in the course of teaching about our practice here, I, I, I stumbled upon a practice that I really didn't know that much about. And that is the practice, uh, there's new platforms out there now that allow an archive or a library or whatever to catalog a collection in one way, but allow, in this case, a tribal community to catalog it yes. in a different way. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Because the assumption in archives and libraries has always been we need standard terms, things can only be defined in one way, and the key to success is having it defined the same way in California as in New York. So this idea of alternative cataloging systems, some of which are accessible only to tribal members, yes. I just find tremendously um, exciting and just opening up so many new questions about archives, including whether we really need to repatriate archives if they can be harnessed intellectually in private ways by different communities. Yeah. And Catalina, how about your experience with, with teaching and, and public history and research? Yeah, for me, they really informed each other um, on different levels. First, so the project Historias para lo que viene, I, I said at the beginning, it was formed by a group of students and faculty. So what we did back then was we established something, there, there's this format here in Colombia called the Semilleros de Investigación, Research Seedbeds. And it's basically as uh, you as a professor create a space outside of the curriculum, outside of the, your regular class course load to work with a group of students who are interested in research. These were traditionally just focused on, on research, right? Students would do archival work, discuss it with you, or do readings and discuss them with you. So what we did with this project was we started one of those seedbeds and we, we designed the public history projects with the students. So since then, I think for, for me, my public history has been tied to the teaching. There's always students involved. For me, students have been an inspiration for this work. They're actually the ones pushing us. You know, we, what are we doing? How can we do this? They've involved, they've um, educated me in terms of, for example, uh, digital languages, you know, because um, they're from a different world. So, They've been very much teaching has been crucial for my for my public history work. I also think my regular classes have, have changed since I've been doing this work. For example, I am less inclined to ask students to write a formal essay. Yes. Of course, sometimes I do, but I am way more interested in having them produce other things. So they produce, for example, right now in my history of Colombia class, which is a, an elective for students from every, not for historians, but for you know, lawyers, economists, engineers. They, we do this history of Colombia 20th century to the present, and their final project is they have to create a digital timeline, picking up a, a topic that interests them, following it a, in the long term through primary sources, entries with a primary source that they analyze and they have to bring it to the present. I actually encourage them to choose something from their present concerns and then you know, go back and try to find resources. So um, that, that I wouldn't have done that before, before I did this kind of work, uh, that wouldn't have occurred to me. Also, I think this is also even, you know, for, I've been working with um, family stories in class which I find is a fascinating way for students to understand that history is not something, you know, away in the past that has no connection with them. So I make them, you know, inquire into our family histories and find the connections with the processes of Colombian history that we've been studying. Again, the product is different, but more than the product, what I'm interested is in having them understand that history is a lie and is part of their lives, not far away. Yeah. So Marnie, uh, how did you want to follow up? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on something Catalina said about her assignments. With my grad students now, increasingly, I think that my job is to teach them to be bilingual. And I don't mean that they, their Spanish should get better. I mean that 
they should know how to write an academic article because they may be moving in that track and that may be the tool they need for the next step in their career, but they also need to know how to write in another way. Um, and I've, I've become much more flexible in my assignments so that your, that your writing can take the form more of narrative history um, or something much more ex experimental. Because we know many of our graduate students are not going on to tenure track jobs. Um, some, some will stay in academia in other ways, others will become lawyers, work for the government, diplomats, even our grad students. They need to know how to communicate in different ways. And whatever their career path, they're not failing me if they don't get a tenure track job at, at the right kind of college or university. Their career is up to them. It is my job to be sure they can communicate to different kinds of audiences using different kinds of vocabularies, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Not every graduate student paper has to have a footnote that's half a page long. Certain academic articles do, but lots of good historical writing doesn't need to be that way. So I've become much more mindful of that in my graduate school classes. And um, really, I, I always now offer a range of kinds of papers people can write. Yeah. I would say in my undergraduate classes, whether it's the Princeton and Slavery course or the archives course that you mentioned a moment ago, Rob, students are writing essays that will be online. Um, and it's very exciting for students to think they're not just writing for me. Yeah. They are writing for whoever might log on to the Princeton University lab Library website this week and see the article they wrote about a previously unresearched photo album or collection of manuscripts in the library collection. And that really ups the ante in a really exciting way. And that was my experience when I started teaching digital history, which was even before I taught um, public history, which was I, I told the students I wanted there to be a wow factor. I wanted them to be able to you know, go home for the holidays or whatever and be telling a family member or a friend about the, the work they're doing and send them the URL and have the family member go wow. Or have the students be able, give them the tools to be able to recreate um, something that looks like the best, their favorite piece of data journalism, uh, for instance. So different ways of telling stories, different digital formats, that's been really transformative for, for my teaching and also my research. Um, for, for when I published my first book, I made a couple of interactive digital exhibits through Esri Story Maps platform um, the, that had sort of other little histories and other kind of primary sources that weren't necessarily included in the book. And, it, and they're standalone exhibits. You don't have to have read the book to understand uh, where, you know, the context uh, and, and the story. And there are links to my website uh, in the physical book so people can you know move from the book to online uh, and we did the same thing we translated them when the Spanish edition of the book um, came out as well so that was I didn't really have an understanding for what public history was then and it was public that was sort of history for the public not really with uh, the public I think I moved more in that direction recently well one I add one thing also yeah, yeah. regarding teaching I've also, um, I had one experience that I really liked designing a class with a colleague from another area, with a designer, a colleague from the design school. So what we realized is she and I started working together on the, on the Historias para lo que viene project. And we realized she teaches a class in which her design students um, create pieces. I, in, in, infography, is that a word in English? Infographic, yeah. Yeah. Infographics. They create infographics, they create podcast, short podcast episodes, booklets. So she did that with her students, had them do a little research project and come up with, she was developing the design skills. And she invited me to evaluate them. And I was amazed at the things these students produced in a few weeks. Yes. But of course, the depth of the research was none. So we decided to teach the class together. We, for a semester, we taught this class called Storytelling and Peace Building in Colombia. And we brought students from design and from history, had them work together. They had to pick a contemporary social justice issue that they, they were interested in. We gave them tools to do oral histories with people, to do research in the library, to inform their topic. And then they created different pieces with their research and we posted them online. So that's another thing, you know, that, that's not, I, I, I never took a history class like that. I was always asked to write papers and was never, invited to go out in the world and do something in the world and produce for the world. 
so yeah well marnie as you said that the academy hasn't caught up with this in terms of the incentive structures and the review structures but yeah, I think the, the last decade has certainly been transformative for historians of Catalina and my generation. Um, and it's not, you know, and, and you've been you've been feeding into that environment. You've been contributing to that environment as well. I, I feel like a dinosaur. I mean, I really have no digital history skills, although I can comprehend what digital history does do. And I've also seen digital history projects that are so time consuming and they're really the payoff isn't that that powerful. Um, but yeah, I do think there is a generational change that's happening now. You all are much more digitally, uh, digitally skilled than I am, and our graduate students now are much more digitally skilled than either of you are, I'm thinking. So I, I do think it's going to change. But that's, that's kind of a, the process piece of things, right? Just because you do digital history doesn't make you a public historian. Right. You can be a, a very academic historian who relies on digital history strategies yeah. to do something. So I think we just need to be hammering away at it so that people get the big message. The kind of public history we're talking about is, is a process. It's a way of working. It's a way of communicating. Um, it em embodies a set of values about how we share our knowledge. Um, and those things aren't always just dependent to, say, digital history. It's, right. it's something bigger. Well, and this was a, a very important experience for me when I published my book in Spanish, um, because it was in some ways, you know, writing for a very different audience than in the US. I mean, we didn't make that many changes in the, in the process of translating it, but it was such a, a powerful learning experience to think about how I was talking about the book and the contemporary resonances of this book at the moment it came out um, in Colombia and the kinds of, sh you know, cultural shorthands and terminological shorthands I could use with a Colombian audience that I couldn't with my uh, US uh, intelligent Martians. Um, uh, and I think that's really encouraged me to think about uh, digital and public history in, in different ways. Uh, as well, and again, particularly in relation to the, the work that I do on, on, on Columbia. Well, let me ask, um, let me pose one more set of questions, which is what texts or projects would you recommend for people who are interested in thinking or learning more about digital history? Now, these could be either foundational theoretical texts or you think very successful public history projects or authors that write in a very accessible narrative fashion. You know, if, if a grad student just came to me with the question, you know, how do I know what it is? There, there are a few books out there, but honestly, I might just tell them to sit down with a few years of a journal like the public historian and just see what people are talking about. And I would say, just scan the footnotes. What, what, what's popping up all the time there now, whether people like it or people are now attacking it. Um, what kind of work feels most exciting to you? I, I, Catalina, you're probably more up on this than I am. I haven't taught public history as public history for about five years now. And I know there's been a, a huge amount of literature that's come out in that time. I am actually opening my syllabus for the last time I taught my public history class to kind of remember what, what I've been assigning there. Because again, it's such a broad world that it's difficult and students can take it in so many directions. But what I usually uh, recommend and begin with in my public history classes is I always because I love it and I always begin with Trujillo silencing the past mm -hmm. always because I think it's a great connection between um, uh, well epistemological questions about history that bridge it with putting history out there in the world right and how why history matters to people why it's powerful and um, so I always begin there because I want to make sure I'm a little bit scared of public history that just begins with a project uh, in which you don't take the time to begin reflecting on, you know, why you're doing this, why are you doing this for that audience and not for another one. Uh, so I do want, I like to begin always with, with the thicker questions. So we do that. Uh, I always also assign them readings where they can see um, um, what's the word? Well, debates or fights around history, you know, why different uh, social groups 
care about how history is told their way or the other way. So, you know, we might do the Edward Glinenthal with the um, story of, the, of World War II on the um, atomic bombs. Or we might bring it um, to the global south and read uh, something on South Africa and the debates around the um, Truth Commission. Um, I am, I am, I never use like the public history manuals. I love listening to the podcast, the 1619 podcast, the New York Times one. Even though, you know, and even to use it to discuss the problems it might have, right? But it's made by a non-historian, it's a journalist, but it changes completely the narrative of American history for a different audience, bringing an issue that's political in the present, informing it from the past. Uh, so I can think about that example. Well, and that's one of my favorite genres of podcasts is one that really sort of move or not to go to Trio's framework, not historicity A, they're historicity B, right? So really breaking down and questioning the narratives that, that we commonly get. Um, and frankly, listening to the, those kinds of podcasts over the last few years um, has been very informative in terms of how I think about and teach and write history. So uh, that's, that's been great for me. Yeah, I, you know, another text that I love to assign them is Rafael Samuel's Theaters of Memory. That's great. Oh, no. I, I, I said I thought I was way behind, but I've assigned every single book that you've assigned, Catalina. So maybe I'm not so out of it as I thought I was. Yeah, that, that's a great one because it's, it's you know, that, that the history workshop movement in, in the UK. So he writes about how history is done by so many other people outside of, of academia, how our work is by no means single authored, but it's a work of many hands. Any, any comments you'd like to, to wrap up with? I found in my practice as a public historian that sometimes I'm forced into this tension that I think we, we should get over. But it's this idea that, you know, of where the ethics of history are, right? So on the one hand, I find many colleagues who will criticize public history work because uh, if it's engaged with the present, it apparently loses any rigor, right? If it's in any way involved with, you know, a, an interest, a stakeholder in the present, then it's like, whoop, we lost it. We lost, we lost our white robe. So there's, you know, like that tension. And then, so I have to advocate for a different ethics, you know, as a historian, which, which involves uh, be, being um, account, accountable for as a historian to the people around me. Uh, and and I, I think, as I said at the beginning, I think it's it's a false dichotomy. It doesn't yes. imply that we we give up our rigor, but for some reason it keeps coming up. You know, it's it's a it's a debate that's there. You know, when and also, for example, in in participating in transitional justice issues, you know, some historians who say no, no, no. If you get involved in those political, that's political. So the, the historian should remain outside. So. Um, yeah, that's that's. I think that's there, and I've seen it in public history conferences. I've participated in the organization of many of the conferences of the International Federation for Public History, and that's a debate that keeps coming back even within the field, you know, between public historians. You know, that's really crazy because let's let's think for a second about the field of historiography, which is a very very traditional field of history. Really, the premise of historiography is the saying, which is an old saw, at least in American circles, history is written with the concerns of the present uppermost in mind. I believe it was said by Frederick Jackson Turner. We, we accept that. And when we look back at histories, whether they were written in the 1870s or written in the 1930s, we can see, yes, they were written with the concerns of the present uppermost in mind. So of course we are writing with present day concerns on our mind. That's how historians have always done it. You cannot escape history. You cannot escape your world and write about it. And I think if this is a case where it is worth looking to anthropologists, I think anthropologists have become very, very self-reflective, of course, as they do their work now, we could perhaps say to a fault, but anthropologists have accepted that, of course, you're, you're implicated in a present day world and that shapes how you, you view your scholarly research. And really historians have to own, own up to that too. You may or may not be an advocate for a cause as part of your present day circumstances, but you are 
absolutely shaped by what's going on around me right now. I say just own it. I don't even see how that can still be an argument anymore. Yeah. Well, that's a really great point to end on. So thank you again so much. This was a personal thrill. It was so, such a rich conversation. Um, I really appreciate your taking the time and I can't wait to share this episode with the world. Thank you so much, bro. And it was great meeting you, Marnie. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to write into your Princeton and Slavery website. Great, and nice to meet you. And thank you, Rob, always a pleasure to see you. Yeah. My guest in part two of this episode is John Marks, who also appeared in Research Craft number six on Devon Think. John is Senior Manager of Strategic Initiatives at the American Association for State and Local History, where he also directs the Public History Research Lab. John holds a PhD from Rice University and is author of the 2020 book, Black Freedom in the Age of Slavery, Race, Status, and Identity in the Urban Americas. John talks about how he got into public history, what the field looks like outside of academia, and how public history has informed his research. John, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Why don't you tell us about your new public history role, relatively new? Yeah, so I work for the American Association for State and Local History. We are the National Professional Association for History Museums, Historical Societies, Preservation Organizations, and the many, many professionals and volunteers who work for them. Um, so I serve as the Senior Manager of Strategic Initiatives and newly as the Director of the Public History Research Lab. Um, so I've worked with uh, AASLH uh, for, for about four years now, since, uh, since 2017, um, and started in, in a kind of entry level coordinator role and have um, slowly, or I guess quickly, um, been, you know, been gathering uh, additional responsibilities and um, helping the organization to do some new things. Um, you know, so generally speaking, my work involves a lot of uh, work on st strategic partnerships, uh, grant applications, uh, grant proposals, bringing in bringing in new projects, um, especially around planning for the 250th anniversary of the United States in 2026 and helping history organizations prepare for that um, and take advantage of, of that opportunity. Uh, but, but my new role at the organization as director of the Public History Research Lab um, stems out of some projects that, that we started over the last couple of years. Um, so we've been doing things like uh, monitoring visitation trends at public history institutions. So is our, is visitation going up or down? Um, how is it different at small institutions and big institutions? Uh, we're working on a project funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation researching Americans' perceptions of what history is and why it's valuable to society society, and then testing communication strategies to more closely align to public understanding with the field's understanding. Um, and, and we're doing a couple of other kind of big field-wide projects like that, um, and they all, they all started individually. Um, and we decided in the past year to kind of put them under a single umbrella uh, of the Public History Research Lab, um, and, and I've been, been serving as the director of that uh, for, the last, uh, for the last several months. Um, and it, it's been really exciting work. Uh, and it's not work that, that another organization is doing. Um, things like the visitation survey, we would get questions about it all the time from members, from history organizations. And we started to realize that if we weren't answering these questions about public engagement with history, um, there wasn't someone else that was going to answer them. They were just going to go unanswered. Um, and so we kind of started from, from that perspective and said, we should at least try to answer some of these questions, even if it's not the ideal way to do it. And have sort of built up from there over the last, you know, the last couple of years and have gotten to a point where we felt comfortable formalizing it uh, earlier, earlier in 2021. Was public history something you had had a lot of exposure to prior to starting this role? I, I don't know your own past experience uh, with the field during graduate school, for instance. Yeah, so I definitely didn't think of myself as a public historian when I was in graduate school. Um, you know, I didn't do like a formal certificate program or anything like that. Um, you know, I, when I was in graduate school, again, was getting my PhD, I definitely expected to end up on the tenure track, expected to end up in an academic position, um, expected to you know, be at a university. I also had, but I did have some other experiences that um, I think inclined me towards this kind of work. Um, so I served as the uh, as the assistant director of a campus-wide race studies organization um, that was housed in the Department of Sociology. Um, I organized uh, with a colleague, Whitney Stewart, um, organized a a major symposium about race and nation in the age of emancipation, um, and you know, put out a call for papers, got you know, raised funds from around the university, uh, you know, brought people to campus, did everything from you know, 
the call for proposals and editing the volume that came after it to catering uh, for the event. Um, and during that process kind of realized that like I was sort of a, a replacement level scholar, uh, but that I would maybe have a you know, unique inclination towards some of the administrative and organization and kind of strategic planning work that, uh, that those other kinds of roles involved. Um, and so I had a, at least an idea when I was in graduate school that I might end up in, you know, you know, working for a research center at a university, right, where I'm, you know, teaching half time and, and running a center half time or something like that. Uh, but after it became clear that uh, you know, that I was not going to be able to get uh, a job in academia, or at least waiting for that was not something I was willing to do, um, I kind of transitioned and uh, and leaned on some of those skills I had developed uh, and some of those experiences I had developed to find a full time role in, in the public history world. Um, and was very fortunate to to land at at AASLH, which is a pretty small organization. Um, it has afforded me the opportunity to uh, to do some well, to do some things I wouldn't have uh, had the opportunity to do at uh, at, at some place bigger. Great. Uh, and how how is learning about public history, becoming involved in the field, sort of changed the way that you think about the way that we do history more generally? Yeah, it, it's been a really enlightening experience for me. Um, I think going, you know, it was a, a trauma to go from, you know, thinking you're going to be in academia to not. Um, but I think ending up in the public history field helped me kind of reconnect to why I started studying history in the first place in a lot of ways. Like I, I think this happens to a lot of us, you know, I didn't go into, you know, I didn't major in history as an undergrad or even go to graduate school because, you know, I wanted to be a big time scholar um, and, you know, wanted to um, be at an Ivy League institution or, or whatever, you know, I did it because I, I liked history and I thought history was important and history can help people understand the world around them. And I think ending up in, a, in the public history universe helped me reconnect with that and sort of understand how people outside the academy are doing that work every day um, in a way that I think people who are inside the academy can often miss. Um, and there's often, uh, you know, often different feelings about that among public history practitioners, depending on depending on who you ask about, uh, you know, sort of the approach that uh, academics can take sometimes of, you know, this idea that, that they know best and they're, you know, imparting their knowledge to the public, the lowly public history institution. Um, and uh, I think that is, uh, you know, a perspective that you very clearly can see the other side of once you start working with public history institutions and see the incredible work that they're doing and see, you know, the, the incredible impact that they're having on the way people understand the past um, you know so it was a, just a total reorientation of how I thought about the impact of scholarship and the mm -hmm. impact of history work and all the different forms it can take you know like who you know what is having a bigger impact is it a book that you know a 300 page book that's published with a university press that you know ends up being 40 or 50 dollars to buy or is it 300 words of text at a, you know, on a roadside marker or on a, um, you know, on a historical marker in, you know, in a downtown area um, that hundreds and hundreds of people are going to see and read every day. Um, you know, it's more difficult to put, you know, you wouldn't be able to put a historical marker or an exhibit panel uh, in a tenure file the same way. Um, but the, the number of people who are, who are reading that and are, you know, using taking in that information and helping using that to help them make sense of the past and the present and the future, uh, you know, is often much, much higher than these, uh, you know, than, than a longer study. And that's not to say that, you know, academic studies aren't useful because I'm still a, a scholar and I'm still working on a book project. Um, and I, you know, and that's obviously still important being able to see sort of the, the, the universe of history work in a, in a broader way has been, has been really enlightening. And, um, really exciting to do for the last couple of years. That's great. Yeah, and that's been my experience too, as beginning to teach public and applied history at my new position at Minerva over the past year. It's really changed the way that I think about why we're doing history and reconnecting me to that question, question of audience um, that, that you just described so well. Um, and then, so you mentioned uh, your current um, book project, which is a really great study um, called Lives and Liberty. Um, it has, the work you've done in public history and this change perspective on the doing of history sort of affected how you're approaching the project and, and carrying it out on a very practical level? Yeah, I mean, it certainly had an impact on the way I conceived the project um, and really wanting to do the project at all. 
right? Like I, I wrote my first book because I had written the dissertation and I thought it was a study that warranted becoming a book. And, you know, just, uh, it was important to me to make that happen. Uh, you know, I, I and, and so I put in a couple of years of effort to turn it pretty quickly from a dissertation into a book. And, and that came out, uh, my first book, Black Freedom in the Age of Slavery came out in October of 2020. Um, but I had this idea, um, sort of seeded by a colleague from grad school like 10 years ago um, about this book about the uh, enslaved people who were then emancipated by George Washington. Um, and uh, I've been doing a lot of work in my, in my job at ASLH around the 250th anniversary. And this just seemed like such a perfect story to tell in conjunction with the 250th anniversary, especially as you know, conversations about the history of race and slavery have, have increased over the last year and a half here. Uh, but you know, I really decided that if I was going to write a second book, it wasn't gonna be a book for my colleagues in the academy. It wasn't gonna be a book aimed at an audience of scholars. It was gonna be a book aimed at a, you know, a much wider uh, a much wider audience, uh, you know, an audience of sort of curious members of the public who are interested in history. Um, and I think history, you know, people love history. Um, they, you know, it's obviously having its kind of moment right now where history, where people are talking about history all the time, uh, but people really like history. And um, I think we often don't give members of the public enough credit for how discerning they can be about about good, you know what is good history and what isn't. Um, and you know, I really wanted to write a, I really want to write a book for that audience. Um, and it's, I think, working in public history has helped me help me get a better appreciation for just how widespread uh, interest in history is. Um, and you know, certainly looking at the you know, the New York Times bestseller list uh, over the last year or two years. It's a, you know, it's a lot of works of history in there, but, you know, history is one of the, there was a recent study by the uh, Humanities Indicators Project, uh, project for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, that uh, found that, you know, was assessing public perceptions of the humanities and found that history is one of the few terms that was viewed favorably by a majority of both uh, conservatives and the majority of liberals. Um, and there's other, you know, there's other studies that, that the AHA is doing, uh, the work that ASLH is doing around framing history that finds like there is this really broad appreciation for history um, and trying to meet that audience where they are and meet that appreciation with a really you know, rigorous and honest uh, interpretation of the past, but one that is, uh, you know, is written for them and not for someone else I thought was, uh, you know, a worthwhile effort. And I wouldn't be going through the effort of trying to write a second book if it was going to be, you know, for a much smaller audience. That's great. That's great. One concluding remarks about public history that you'd like to share? Uh, I think it's a, you know, it's a fascinating and, and enormous field. Um, I think that's something that, uh, you know, that I didn't have an appreciation for until I started working for a association serving public history institutions. Um, but by our most recent count, there are more than 26,000 public history institutions of various kinds around the country, museums, historical societies, historic sites. Um, and they're, they're all doing, and not to mention all the sort of history adjacent institutions that there are, uh, you know, they're all doing uh, you know, interesting, interesting work that's having an impact on their communities. A lot of these small organizations are serving communities that no other educational or, uh, or cultural institutions are serving um, and you know, supporting those institutions and connecting our work uh, as scholars with the work that those public history institutions are doing, learning from those institutions and learning from the communities they serve, uh, I think can, can, can help us all sort of raise the, the historical discourse and um, you know, better use history to inform the present um, and, and plan for the future. Uh, so it's been exciting and enlightening work and um, it's sort of uh, not the path I plan to be on, uh, but it's one that I'm, I'm glad I ended up on. Well, we're grateful for the work you're doing. I'm so impressed personally by the, your ability to continue, even as the father of a young child, you know, keep up an active research agenda at the same time as you're doing this, this desk job. So um, really appreciate getting to talk to you, uh, follow you on Twitter as well, which is how we met each other. Um, so thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of Research Craft. Remember to check the episode description below for a bibliography listing the books and public history projects referenced in the episode. Please subscribe to this channel so you get notified about new episodes. 
Research Craft is also now on Twitter at research underscore craft. You can find me at R.A. Carl, where I often tweet research tips that don't make it into these episodes.